So welcome uh, everybody to this uh, our uh, a new event in our series of Quantum Portugal uh, lectures. And today is uh, with great pleasure that we welcome as a speaker, Professor Christian Schneider. Um, he's a professor in quantum materials at the physics uh, department of the University of Oldenburg in Germany. And he's also the leader of the quantum materials group uh, there. So he, he actually got his PhD in 2012, working on nanostructures and semiconductors. And then from 2012 to 2020, he leads also there at the University of Bussburg, the group of uh, spectroscopy in the chair of technical physics of the University of Bussburg, actually. And then in 2020 is when, uh, when, when he moves to his current position in as professor in the University of Oldenburg, right? And, um, and I'm very uh, pleased to have Christian here because I think uh, the topics uh, uh, he addressed in his research are very, indeed, very relevant for uh, for this uh, for for these lectures. Uh, so he works in uh, different aspects of quantum materials, um, especially in how light interacts with these uh, quantum materials, no? and how we can engineer engineering light states, we can modify also the, the properties of those materials. And, um, and he has made, I would say, seminal, uh, several seminal works, uh, especially on the properties of 2D materials when they, when, when they interact with light, no? uh, in the many body effects in 2D materials, uh, both sensed and condensation, superfluidity, topological phenomena, and something we, uh, we actually uh, are very interested also here at INL in single photon emission. No? And just to finish, uh, some uh, well, some numbers. No, you, uh, Christian has published more than 2,000, uh, two, 200, not 2,000. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 could be as well, but 200 by now articles, um, uh, several book chapters, and, uh, and he got several uh, prestigious uh, grants, uh, including the starting grant uh, from the ERC Council in in 2016. And, um, and before we start, I would like to mention that, uh, that our speaker is happy to take questions even during the talk. Uh, so um, if you want uh, all the people attending, you can write your questions in the Q&A um, chat, not in the normal chat. It's better if you write them in the Q&A chat, and I will uh, translate these questions to Christian during the talk. And with this, well, I'm, I'm very pleased to give the floor to uh, to you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Uh, yeah, it's also very nice seeing you again after I don't know how many years. But um, well, I, I actually have never made it to Portugal. I was so happy <laughs> you invited me. In the like, ah, I can't travel on my own. It's, it's really, it's really a shame. Um, now we're stuck here with a very lousy weather in the very north of Germany, but. Um, We'll, we'll hang in here, okay? Um, all right, so the, the, the topic of the, um, of the lecture um, is uh, exciton polaritons in microcavities with atomic lithium crystals. It's um, one of the major topics we're investigating at the moment in the group in Oldenburg. It's not the only one, like Martin said. Um, we're also doing single photon emitters in, in, in uh, quantum materials and uh, topological phenomena of Bose Einstein condensates in more traditional materials. But at the moment, I would, I would say it's, it's one of my favorite topics is this uh, two dimensional material research because it's, you know, it's, it's full of uh, unexplored territory and surprises. And um, I hope I can share a few with them, uh, a few of them with you. Um, that is my, my current group. Um, it's uh, only eight guys, including myself. Um, so we, we really don't have any gender balance in the group, but uh, it's also a very young group. We moved uh, in, the, in uh, last July to, to Oldenburg, and now we're start, we starting to set it up very, very slowly. Um, the people with the arrows on top, uh, so this uh, gentleman here on the right with the arrow is Carlos Anton Solanas, who, who did uh, most of the experimental works dedicated to the first part of the presentation. And the first to the very left is uh, Dr. Han Yong Shan, who did most of the work um, according to the central part of the presentation on room temperature polariton research. And then Lucas Lackner is the guy in the center 
with it, uh, the work with the open cavity and the optical lattices that I hopefully have time to share with you at least a few aspects in the very end, because it gives also a very nice perspective of the field, how we can maybe move on from very fundamental exploration of phenomena uh, to uh, quantum technology, at least it can give us a hint. maybe. Um, so the, the, the experiments that are going to um, discuss with you, they were basically done on the interface between Würzburg and Oldenburg. Part of them were already done in Würzburg. Some of them were later done um, uh, in Oldenburg or um, aspects of both experiments were basically back and forth at the transition stage when we were moving the group. Um, and also we got a lot of theory support from the group of Alexei Kavukin, who's in uh, Westlake University. Um, our material uh, that we like our, our, our material crystals uh, are grown by Seth Tongai at Arizona State University, and I have to make an advertisement for Seth. He's very happy to team up with new teams, with young teams. He's very generous uh, in supplying his his crystals. So I can I can really only recommend to uh, contact the guy if you want to enter this field. He's an excellent grower. He's very generous. He engineers crystals for us uh, if we want to have slightly different properties. So um, I, I would say this, this is really uh, fueling the research we're doing here. Um, and the hexagonal boronitride that we're using for protecting uh, his uh, material comes from NIMS, from uh, Watanabe and Tanikuchi. And um, okay, funding agencies are also listed here, even though the, the ERC unfortunately runs out next year. So um, then uh, we have to see. Who, who gives us the rest of the money. <laughs> All right, so since this is a, a quantum lecture, I decided to start this, uh, this, this, this uh, lecture with a quantum. Um, and then we will put it, I think, more in perspective uh, over, over, over the talk. But um, as, as you know, um, uh, current quantum technologies are subdivided into these four pillars, which is already outlined in the manifesto, I think you've signed all in 2015 or so. And we basically said, okay, this, this is the, the, the current um, research strategy, which, which needs to be supported um, also by the funding agencies and we subdivided into quantum sensing, quantum simulation, quantum computation and quantum communications. These are the four main pillars, which are the most likely to turn into some real world technology um, uh, at, at, at the time. Um, if, you, if you're coming from a solid state uh, kind of perspective, and to enter this field, at least for me, I, I had in mind when I when I hear about quantum, I immediately think about uh, nanostructures. Where we have a single quantum as quantum particle, a spin or a single exciton emitting single photons. So, uh, so sort of like this whole quantum business, uh, at least initially for me, was entangled with the preparation, manipulation, and engineering of individual quantum states in, in solid state, um, which is very demanding. Um, but it's, it's maybe not, not even completely true because uh, as, as you all know, the quantumness uh, in, in matter much more profoundly manifests in macroscopic quantum phases, at least from, a, from an out, outside perspective, right? Uh, I, I, I usually bring up the example of the macroscopic three. That's actually a term which is not invented by me and I've forgotten which Nobel Prize lecture it was was, uh, I think it was actually the catalyst lecture where he used that term, uh, the macroscopic three. These are the three main um, fundamental uh, manifestations of macroscopic quantum phenomena, uh, which turned into, at least two of them turned into a full technology already. And all the three of them obviously and rightfully um, helped the uh, investigators to receive the Nobel prizes, so laser radiation, superconductivity and superfluidity. And, um, I would say that the, the, the latter two, um, superconductivity and superfluidity, are very closely linked to what I call basically the mother of all macroscopic quantum phases, which is the Bose Einstein condensate, which was predicted by, as the name says, Bose and Einstein around uh, 24, 25, well, first, first discussed by Bose, then revisited by Einstein in their, in their famous uh, exchange of. Of traditional letters, I think they exchanged them in German, if I'm not mistaken. I had once a look into that, but it's very interesting also how they how they how they refer to each other and how we do communication in academia right now. Uh, it's a kind of kind of uh, amusing uh, anecdote if you're interested in these kind of aspects of of, of academia, which I can also only recommend. Um, okay, uh, in a nutshell, they they basically proposed that if you take um, 
to take a gas of uh, indistinguishable bosons, um, if you cool the gas down, uh, such that uh, within the de Broglie wavelength, they overlap. Um, at some point, they will collapse collapse in a macroscopic quantum state, which you can describe by one order parameter or one macroscopic wave function. And uh, this is actually your quantum state as a well-defined phase. Um, it's basically uh, described like one single quantum particle. And um, the math is also kind of straightforward if you're interested in the, in the development of in the, in the spatial temporal development, you have to use this uh, gross Podolsky equation and uh, you, you can, you can uh, calculate how the, the Bose-Einstein condensate behaves. Um, from, a, from a statistical viewpoint, um, it's also kind of straightforward and I think taught basically in every statistical mechanics lecture all over the planet, you, you have your indistinguishable bosons, the occupation probability is given by the Bose-Einstein distribution. And then if you start to calculate the numbers of particles in the excited state in three dimensions, you will realize that after uh, reducing the temperature below a critical temperature, the chemical potential goes towards zero. And at, at that point, you start basically to fill in more and more particles into this ground state. And if you're now working out uh, the, the, the wave function, the ground state, it's basically just a product state of all the individual single particle wave functions. And um, uh, in that sense, uh, your collective wave function starts to develop off diagonal, off diagonal long range order, it means coherence in its own. In 2D, it's a bit more complicated and therefore uh, massively oversimplified since this is not a theory lecture. Um, in 2D, this trick doesn't work out any longer. You can always solve this integral, which uh, associates the particle number with the, uh, the Bose-Einstein distribution function and the density of states. Um, there, you have to basically reduce your system either to a finite size, size and include interactions to get phenomena which are heavily linked to the condensation of bosons in 3D. This is usually um, uh, associated to a Beretzinski kostritz taulis transition in two, dimension, in two dimensions. Also, uh, the development of the, of, of the uh, long range order of the spatial coherence is slightly different. Uh, here in, in 2D, you usually have an al al algebraic decay of your, of your coherence. Um, all right, but this, this is, this is a, a sort of, I would, I would say, a sort of important asset if you think about uh, making uh, condensates with two dimensional crystals, because you first have to be aware that the uh, practice in a macroscopic two dimensional system is actually not straightforward to, to get something like, um, like a Bose Einstein condensate per se. Now, um, as, you, as you are probably aware of, um, making a regular BEC like the one of Cornell and Diemann, which they got the Nobel Prize for is extremely difficult because you need to cool down the system to extremely low temperatures. In this case, uh, I think this was uh, the, um, uh, I think 200 nano Kelvin um, in order to get to the quantum degeneracy point because they had to make the, the, the gas very dilute. If they, if they work at higher, de higher densities, uh, you start to get crystallization. So uh, on a temperature scale, um, the, the point where Bose-Einstein condensate starts to become prominent is on the nano to micro, micro Kelvin scale. So it's really, really hard to motivate this approach as a quantum technology, whereas it's absolutely fine for fundamental research, but um, it's a very expensive, very difficult task in the laboratory. And there I have another, um, another um, anecdote from the novel lecture, Ketele, where he already suggests that maybe uh, uh, excitons uh, are, I'm not saying the better candidate, but a more feasible candidate for these kind of experiments. And um, that's something I figured out that uh, indeed um, the initial evidence for the Einstein condensation was, uh, was reported in a crystal of cuprous oxide, but then the paper had to be retracted. Um, that's why probably the Nobel Prize didn't go to excitons, uh, but to uh, called atom BEC. Um, that's a shame. Um, but even when he, when he received his Nobel Prize here, he was already suggesting that the exciton, which are strongly interacting with light in the cavity, AKA exciton polaritons are, are probably really hot candidates for these kind of experiments for, for various reasons. And um, those um, uh, are kind of um, gonna outline uh, in, in this slide. So um, these are experiments obviously, which were done later after, um, after the Nobel Prize of uh, Ketele. Um, 
But uh, so in, in 2006, for instance, Jacek Kasprychak um, demonstrated that uh, um, at least under some conditions, the condensation of exciton polaritons into a ground state can occur uh, under conditions which are very close to thermal equilibrium. And that, that was new by that time because uh, non like, uh, um, I, mean, I mean, states which were macroscopically filled but completely out of thermal equilibrium in this uh, exciton polariton um, uh, cavities, they have been known before. But, but uh, BEC is something which has a defined temperature, so you have to be thermalized. Um, uh, that was that was uh, observed 2006 uh, at, at cryogenic temperatures. Um, Alberto Amo uh, discovered the superfluidity. Then uh, these topological excitations were widely investigated uh, in sort of um, um, uh, I don't know. Um, I think this was a Galio Marsner sample in the group of Lakodakis. Uh, but more recently, now um, the community is looking into ways into um, really going there the step from this fundamental exploration of phenomena into technologically application relevant systems. And, and one, one system also basically inspired by the experiments from the cold atom community is uh, quantum simulation, where you basically use optical lattices to imprint Hamiltonians or symmetries into, into your uh, macroscopic quantum state. And then you can check you can find ground states, you can test the development of the Hamiltonian in, in space and time. That, that is really the philosophy here. Um, okay, so now let's go back to the fundamental uh, fundamentals of exciton polarity. So the system which um, uh, I will discuss for the rest of the lecture is, um, is, a, is a DBR cavity with two Bragg reflectors which confine the optical light field in between of the two. And in the center, we have a sandwiched monolayer of transition metal dichalcogenides where excitons can be formed and excitons can emit light into the cavity. And um, since absorption and emission both is possible and under the condition that the Bragg mirrors are sufficiently good to store the light field inside of the cavity before, for, so such that they can be reabsorbed with a high probability before they leak out, you get basically a modification um, of the eigenstates of the system, which is described by this coupled oscillator equation here. So in this regime that the dipole coupling here between light and excitons is stronger than the dissipation or the losses of the system, you will no longer be, have the exciton and the photon mode as the eigenmodes of the system, but you have mixed mode, polariton modes. And the, the beauty here is really that you can easily measure this. This is actually, it's a gallium arsenide experiment, but it, it, it does the trick. So here, this is a reflectivity measurement. The black line here is the reflectivity of, of the cavity. And now as we tune the cavity, oops, sorry, oops. I have to do this in this mode. You still see it, right? Okay, now if you're, if you're tuning the cavity towards the exciton, it does not cross, but you see this anti-crossing behavior. So you see that um, the modes, they start to mix, they start to couple, and there is a persisting energy gap here at the position where they were supposed to cross each other if the coupling was zero. And that, that's basically the Rabi gap, which, which tells you that you are in the strong coupling regime um, in um, in such a device. That's that's the core the core signature here. Okay, and you see another thing. So in in the two dimensional cavity, this lower this lower branch here is actually parabolic. Um, if you're not new to if you if you're new to the field, it sounds a bit exotic because it's actually a light light like it, it's a photon. A photon you know has a linear dispersion relation. But if if you trap this in between two mirrors. It acquires this parabolic dispersion relation, so your photon actually acquires a mass itself. Once you tune it towards the exciton, the mass gets heavier and heavier. So you can actually level out the effective mass of, of your of your state in the cavity, and that's something which is quite powerful um, because if you're now going back to statistical mechanics, the critical temperature for a Bose-Einstein Bose condensate is inversely, inversely proportional to the effective mass of your boson. So if you have a polariton, your effective mass can be on the order of 10 to the minus four of the free electron mass. 
which brings you seven, eight, nine orders of magnitude below the mass of the sodium atom where you had to go to the nano Kelvin range. Okay, so this formula immediately tells you, okay, this, this should be easily possible at room temperature without, without any, 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 any issues, right? The, and and it, it has been basically now routinely be done at cryogenic temperatures in um, three, five cavities. The only problem with gallium arsenide, which has been the workhorse platform for these kind of experiments is that in gallium arsenide, excitons themselves, they are not sufficiently strongly bound. So if you heat up your chunk of crystal to room temperature, the exciton will firmly dissociate. And you cannot do these experiments anymore because you don't have excitons anymore. No excitons means there's no bosons, there is a just plasma, uh, which you cannot let, which, which you cannot uh, um, bring into the, into the condensed phase, at least uh, not with these easy assumptions. And um, here, um, the transition metal dichalcogenides, they're actually kind of, kind of promising because um, in, in these monolayer crystals, excitons, they should be stable up to room temperature and above the exciton binding energy routinely is between 200 and 500 milli electron volts. So if, we, if you're drawing the phase diagram, which we, which we did here in this pictorial graph, there is actually kind of a lot of room in this uh, condensed area, which goes obviously from cryogenic um, up to room temperature. Just you need to um, build the correct device for that. Um, so this, this is uh, maybe more meant as a side comment because, um, uh, so this, this uh, exciton polariton physics is actually, it's kind of a very broad field. Um, we, we are mostly looking into this condensed phenomena at high densities, but it, I think even in particular right now, and I don't know how many uh, undergrad students are in the audience, but in particular right now, I actually do see an extremely fast development in the field of polaritonics uh, where, where different aspects are actually addressed. And I think one of the most important uh, disciplines is uh, in, in, in chemistry, where people are now using exciton polaritons to tailor and steer chemical reactions, which is, I think, something which is right, just starting right now with first experiments. But there, there's, there's all kind of different uh, aspects in material science where you can actually use the strong light matter coupling um, to manipulate materials, to manipulate excited and ground state properties, transport, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, not, it's not only about polariton condensation research, there's, there's a lot of different um, sub aspects in the field that um, uh, make this research extremely um, exciting. There's actually a kind of kind of nice article here of, uh, of Basov where he basically tries to summarize all the different kind of polaritons that are now available to the community. And I think he summarizes up more, more than 70 different kind of polaritons uh, that you can research on, which is marvelous. I didn't know that, so, so I'm just, I'm telling you these uh, these little anecdotes. Um, okay, so um, if you if you want to study room temperature polaritons, as I was already indicating, you need materials which have an exciton binding energy much larger than twenty five milli electron volts, and there are different candidates and um, uh, semiconductors, perovskites, organic materials typically have very strongly bound Frankel excitons, but um, I will I will obviously. Um, Strict myself to transition metal dichalcogenides um, um, because binding energy is very strong. You have this exciting Rydberg series of of excitons, which which is non-standard in in most of the other um, new materials that are used for polariton research, and they all have different properties in terms of their interaction with light. Um, it's a material which is a kind of I wouldn't say cheap. But if you compare it to gallium arsenide, it definitely is, is, is uh, not expensive. And you can get marvelous material properties even with scotch tape exfoliation. So this is a spectrum which we, which we measured, uh, I think, a few years ago. And we, we, it's kind of reproducible. So uh, PL of molybdenum diselenide with a line width of on the order of 2 milli electron volts. But it's seen uh, in many groups. And I think it's still very surprising that it works that well. But it really, uh, it's, it's something um, which is available to all kind of small scale groups as a material platform with extremely high um, optical properties. 
It's also a very, a very nonlinear material because it breaks inversion symmetry and it has all these topological phenomena associated uh, with, with, the, uh, with the symmetry of the crystal, including spin belly locking. It displays spin hole physics because the Berry curvature is different between the two valleys. And some of the 2D crystals are also topological insulators, which could be interesting if you want to combine optics and transport measurements. And that's something which is not readily available in all the other material platforms. Um, right, there's been many, many, uh, many groups have entered the field and investigate strong coupling with uh, TMD crystals in micro cavities, just for, for the reason that I said, it's available, it's very handy, it's very high quality. Um, however, the um, the high density regime where this uh, condensation phenomena should manifest, it's still uh, a bit of an ongoing challenge. And um, so we are, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, now introducing the, our, our methodology, how we, are, how we are producing the cavities, which we're then using for these kind of experiments. And it was a, it's a method that was invented by this guy, uh, Niels Lund, former PhD student of mine. And he got really frustrated with the complexities of depositing material on top of, uh, of the monolayers, most of the monolayers got destroyed. Uh, or if you put a polymer on top, the monolayer is still okay. But then if you try to deposit a Bragg mirror on top of polymer, you basically destroy the Bragg mirror. So what he did is he was just using two commercial Bragg mirrors and he used a screwdriver and destroyed one of them. And it was literally a screwdriver. And then the Bragg mirror was fragmented on the table. And then he used a PDMS stamp, the same one he's using for transferring the monolayer material to pick up the, frag the fragment of the, of the mirror, which he was then placing on top of the PMMA. And like that, he formed the micro cavity. Um, with, this, with this crazy technique, he, he managed he immediately, that's the, one of the first attempts to get micro cavities with Q factors larger than 4,000. Not saying they're all larger than 4,000, but I think routinely we are having Q factors above 1,000, up to 5,000 and so on and so forth. And the, it's just nice that the, the method has already been picked up by other groups. So this is really, uh, <laughs> and I think they're also using a screwdriver. <laughs> all right, this is also, we, we, we've tried to publish the details here in this APL paper if you're interested in, but um, it, it really works and we're still, we're still doing it. With the Okay, so um, now um, this is a photoluminescence measurement on, the, on, on such a cavity, which is loaded with a single monolayer of molybdenum diselenide. And here we're only looking at the photoluminescence from the lower polariton branch. So you see it has this parabolic dispersion relation. It has a distinct mass in the order of, I think, 10 to the minus four of the free electron mass. And if you're now tuning the energy here, in this case, by temperature, you can see that it, it makes this canonical anti-crossing behavior of two modes, which are now separated by the Rabi energy of 35 or 40 milli electron volts. So it's completely clear, okay, we're in the strong coupling regime here, we see the anti-crossing. And um, the, the one, 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 one thing we were back then puzzled is if it's possible to address this polaritons resonantly, because many of the, of the properties by that time, that was 2018 roundabout, Many of the properties of the polaritons were completely unclear. If, 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 the, if the valley character of the material or the spin character of the material is actually transferred into the strong coupling regime and what are the, what are the intrinsic mechanisms. So we were looking for a technique to actually um, make a clean experiment by resonantly driving a mode here, which we, which we pre-select. And that's a very hard experiment if you only have standard optics equipment because you're working with a resonant laser on your on your detection frequency, meaning you, well, you have a lot of um, problems with stray light. Um, but here we were actually harnessing the nonlinearity of the material itself, so we were using an infrared laser because the monolayers have no invert like they 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 have no inversion center. They generate very strong second harmonic generation signals. So we could use the long wavelength laser to drive the exciton transition resonantly but with half of the energy and um, that was that was known by then that it works with a single monolayer but here we found that it actually works with the polaritons as well it works quite marvelously you see this ground state here you can really nicely address this is the second harmonic generation signal 
driven by this uh, laser of half of the energy of the of the, of the state here. So you really found a, found a way to address these states in a resonant manner without being disturbed by by uh, by stray light contaminating um, our signal. And like that, we could actually now test if we can address um, in the strong coupling regime um, valley polaritons, polaritons which are only coupled to the K or the K prime valley of the dispersion relation um, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the atomically thin crystals. Uh, by that, we were, we were polarizing our laser here with half of the energy of the polariton state, for instance, sigma plus here. And then we were driving um, that mode, which is a few milli electron volts uh, um, blue shifted to the, to the ground state. And we were measuring the luminescence, which is emitted from this ground state, okay? If, if, the, if, if the system retains the valley character, if we inject a polariton, which is only coupled to one of the two distinct valleys of the TMV, um, then it should emit actually the same polarization as it's driven with. Um, in this scheme here, um, you have a swap of the sign of the polarization, which comes from the threefold uh, symmetry of the crystal. So if you're, if you're basically working in second harmonic generation uh, configuration and two sigma plus spins are converted to one sigma minus spin in the, in, in, in the process. What is, what is exciting here is actually that the degree of polarization which we retain from the polariton states here is larger than 90%. That, that, that is a very high, a very high degree of of spin polarization fidelity um, in these materials, in particular moly D selenide, which is kind of notoriously known to be hard to spin polarized, even at cryogenic temperatures. I think in the bare monolayer by then the record was 20, 30 percent. If you couple it strongly to the microcavity um, with this technique of, of excitation, we, we saw this uh, extremely high degrees of circular polarization emitted from, 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 the, from the cavities. And the reason is kind of, kind of straightforward to understand. So when, 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 you, when you have an exciton, it decays with the characteristic decay time. When it's coupled to the cavity, the characteristic decay time changes because you're now hybridizing to the photon. The photon itself has a leakage time. So if the photon doesn't live very long in the cavity, the whole system has less and less time to actually depolarize and, and convert a spin up into a spin down exciton in the process or a K into a K prime valley exciton, if you, if you wish. And um, that, that can actually, you can, you can uh, back calculate here from the characteristic time scales that are known, taken from the experiment and indeed uh, one would even expect to observe this high degree of, um, of, of valley polarization in these kind of experiments. Um, so this, this, is, um, this is showing you that uh, with the TMD, because of this peculiar dispersion relation, you can not only strongly couple to the cavity, you can even pick a valley and let this one valley strongly couple to the micro cavity, which is nice. You can even do the same, same kind of experiment in linear polarization, where you now with your linear polarized pump laser uh, generate a coherent superposition of a K and the K prime exciton. And well, if, if, if they are not defacing, then the light, which is again radiated from the micro cavity should retain the same degree of linear polarization as the pump. And as you, as you can see here, even, even this scheme works um, surprisingly well. So we see degrees of linear polarization, of linear polarization larger than, um, than 90% um, for, 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 this, um, for this particular micro cavity, which was, you know, a bit cherry picked, so not, not every sample displays these degrees, um, but in principle, it shows you that it's, it's, it's possible to address um, um, this uh, valley physics very nicely by strongly coupling to the micro cavity. Um, you have to say, uh, Martin, uh, how, how many more minutes do I have? Because the timer kind of stopped on my side. Yeah, no, we have time. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I will, you, I will you let you let know. Me know. You have to let me know five minutes before the end because somehow my yeah. timer my timer got frozen and I have no I have no idea. <laughs> no worries. I'm I'm taking care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Um, all right. So uh, so the, so this this first experiment really was was uh, was designed to show you that we can even in the strong coupling regime exploit distinct properties of the materials which are then manifested in the outcome of the experiment. I think it's kind of something kind of valuable 
to have because it also tells you okay the, the, the choice of the material itself can be used to to um to steer um uh, your experiment in the end of the day now uh, in the next experiment we were trying to assess what's happening if we're increasing the polariton density with a slightly off resonant laser that's um with obviously the target to see if we can get such a high polariton density in a particular state such that it starts to be degenerate and displace some coherence. So the, the micro cavity is kind of similar to the first one I was showing you. Um, now the only difference is here that the bottom Bragg mirror is no longer silicon dioxide and titanium dioxide, but it's uh, aluminum arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. Um, there is no particular reason for that choice, to be honest. It's just because in my old institution with, uh, with Sven Höfling, we had a lot of growth activities and um, we were basically trying all kinds of material combina combinations for the, for the surrounding microstructures. And um, alas, algas is simply the most common combination for exciton polaritons in gallium arsenide, which are working in the same spectral range. So why not try it here? So that, that, is, that is the heterostructure here. Um, the molybdenum diselenide monolayer is kept with hexagonal boron nitride, then this thing called PMMA to make the, the lambda cavity complete. And on top, again, we use the screwdriver, destroy a mirror and flip chip it on top. So this, this uh, um, peculiar shape here, which looks like an iron to, um, um, I don't know, to, to flatten your sweater. That is the top mirror here. This is the mono layer here uh, in this, uh, this dashed area. And um, here is where we conduct the experiment. Um, in this case, the dispersion relation looks a little bit more um, unconventional as, as opposed to the first experiments where I was, which I was sharing with you. You see here luminescence from the lower polariton mode. Um, here we had a spectral filter, which we had to use for the high power experiment in order not to spoil uh, with scattered light. You see a little bit of light coming from this mode here, which is actually leaking from the outside of the mono layer, where the system is in the weak coupling. So we can actually indirectly see the, the empty cavity energy. Um, and um, the experiment is conducted with a pulsed excitation laser which we are tuning here resonantly to the upper polariton branch. So that's a kind of common technique to inject carriers efficiently through the upper branch where there is a mode of the system and then they can relax quickly to the lower branch by emission of phonons, which is kind of efficient if the energetic separation between the two branches is approximately one, one phonon energy, one low phonon energy, so 30 milli electron volts. And uh, that, that is a condition we are approx approximately matching here. So we, we drive the system uh, in the upper branch, approximately a phonon energy on top of the lower branch. And now we're studying what's happening if we're cranking up the power of the laser. And um, that, is, that is shown here. So we're still at low power. Now it jumps and at, at, at the given threshold, which you can see now, basically all the energy relaxes to the ground state of the lower polariton dispersion. And at higher powers, you see some uh, thermal excitations of these wings again, but there is a very sudden drop where the shape of the spectrum modifies and the intensity which is emitted from the ground state basically has almost a step here. So this is sharper than, sharper than a conventional laser which as you plot the PL as a function of the, in, of the input power usually develops an S. In that case, it's, it's almost a digital increase of power over one step width of pump power. There is a reason for that because for some, for some reason, the device is hysteretic. There is a bi-stability which, which, which causes that, uh, but I, we, we don't exactly know where the bi-stability comes from. So I'm not discussing it into more detail. Um, but a part of this threshold behavior we see that the line width of the ground state drops at the same pump power as the threshold here occurs. Um, sorry, that, that's the line width there. And also we see that at very high pump powers, we start to have a spectral shift of the mode. And the, the, the shift is actually going towards higher energy. So it's not heating, but uh, it's an indication that there are some interparticle interactions in the system 
which are modifying the uh, the ground state energy. But it's very big, um, which is actually what you expect from from transition metal dichar coaching. Um, so you can you can calculate the exciton density at threshold. It's approximately ten to the twelve inverse square centimeters. So it's it's less than the mod density where excitons are supposed to uh, ionize in TMDs, and the polariton density is on the order of ten over square square micrometer. So this is uh, approximately it's a little bit more than one polariton at a time in the system. But the numbers they are sort of matching the expect expectation. So. Um, since, since there is already a threshold kind of behavior, uh, that's kind of indicative of, of the formation of, uh, of, of a condensed state. If you really want to, um, want, want to uh, check if, 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 if it's a condensed state, you have to check for coherence. And um, sort of the smoking gun criterion in the field is to check for spatial coherence. So you have to overlap two different points of the sample bring them together on a detector and check if they're, if they're coherent. So if there's basically, um, that's basically spatial coherence, which you can easily measure with a Michelson interferometer. So what, what you do, you, you uh, have your polariton emission from, from your state of interest or your mode of interest, you put it in the interferometer, one mirror is on the translation stage, the other one is a retro reflector, which inverts your, which inverts your, 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 your image. And then on the detector, you bring your image and your inverted image to overlap. So you're basically, basically you're overlapping always pairwise points from different positions of the sample. And if, if they are coherent, then you should expect to see some fringing um, in, the in, in the interference image. And um, that is what we could pick up for ele elevated pump powers. We start, we, we start to see the development interference fringes on the camera image. Um, from this fringing, you can actually calculate an interference contrast as a function of position by some Fourier analysis. It's kind of straightforward. It's a bit technical, that's why I'm sparing it here. But we can calculate as a function of position the degree of first order coherence. And you see that it actually uh, it, it, it evolves over a few micrometers, which is I mean, the sample is kind of finite in size, so we, we could not really expect to see something which is much larger developed. But there is some significance, uh, some significant spatial coherence over a few over a few micrometers uh, at the position where we, where we are driving the condensate. And then, if you if you run the delay arm of your interferometer, you can check by how much you can temporarily delay the two points which you're interfering now in your map. And you see that the interference then um, starts to decrease over a time scale on the order of uh, 300 to 400 femtoseconds, which is more or less the lifetime of a polariton in the cavity. So, I mean, that's always, almost clear. I mean, so it's a pulsed experiment. So um, the, the polariton only lives for a finite time. It's kind of hard to expect some coherence much for, for, for a much longer time. Okay, so this experiment was, was conducted at cryogenic temperatures. Um, the big promise of TMDs, however, is because of the stability of excitons to allow us to assess this regime of high temperature where there should still be some space in the phase diagram to observe something like a phase transition. And um, the first thing that you need to modify experimentally is to, to we have to change the material system. In molybdenum diselenide, it's well known that if you increase the temperature, the, the luminescence yield usually drops by um, more than an order of magnitude, as opposed to the tungsten selenide uh, materials where um, we and other groups are usually encountering the uh, effect that the intensity actually starts to increase if you increase the, the temperature of the, of, of, of the, of the system. That's, that's a, a consequence of the inversion of the bands in the conduction band. So in molyselenide, the ground state is, is, is bright in tungsten diselenide. The excited state is bright. So if you increase the temperature, you start to populate your excited state and the luminescence will increase um, in intensity. Why it's so much brighter than molyselenide at, at room temperature, I still don't properly understand. But it must be related to the material um, quality, but it seems to be kind of canonical because practically every group is observing this phenomenon cannot be explained by Boltzmann statistics, as far as I understand. 
However, so this, so we, we, we rebuilt the sample. Now we're using tungsten based selenite, which is again covered by a thin layer of hexagonal boronitride. Uh, sandwiched in a micro cavity, which is now grown. That, that's actually, that's a cavity which is fully grown um, by our colleagues in Jena. They, they developed um, an evaporation technique, finally, that allows us to bury the monolayers in a in, in really a, a monolithic um, double cavity. And it works, it works quite nicely. The, the Q factors are very high that we're getting with this approach. There is still every now and then a problem that the monolayer fragments during the growth process. And that same thing happens here. So you can see uh, if, if, you're, if you're looking at this dispersion relation, which you pick up experimentally from the sample, it almost looks, it looks a bit disgusting. Huh? This is no, no, no longer a nice parabola, but it, it breaks up into this, uh, into this uh, almost monochromatic modes, which are scattered all over the place here. Um, but it already tells you, okay, probably the monolayer is fragmented to a finite size. Because of the finite size, it uh, it basically develops this uh, discrete resonances, like a quantum bell, that's right, or, or or a quantum dot. And um, we can also model this by 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 assuming um, an effective uh, an effective uh, potential trap of ten milli electron volts and an effective trapping area on the order of four or five uh, micrometers. And that gives us a spectrum which, which looks a little bit alike the one we're picking up experimentally. But it's still, well, we still need to be confronted with, with the question if this is really a polariton, because we simply don't know. You don't see the dispersion relations. You just see a few dispersionless modes. So it's really hard to make an assessment. That's why we were resorting to our favorite technique. We we're mounting the sample in a in a in a magnetic cryostat. Actually, it's a mag magnetic cryostat which we are driving at room temperature. So, but but um, uh, it's this 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 Atto Dry 2100 allows you to ramp up the magnetic field up to nine tesla while keeping the sample itself at 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 uh, 300 kelvin. You can actually see that this monochromatic mode here in the bottom at least it starts to develop a semen splitting. And that's quite a strong argument uh, to, to assume that you're in a strong coupling regime because uh, that's something a weakly coupled a cavity resonance would never do because it simply, uh, well, it doesn't have an excitonic contribution. So it needs to mix to the exciton to develop a semen splitting. So we can absolutely be sure that we're in a strong coupling regime here. We have a G factor on the order of unity, which is also kind of matching the expectations to a certain degree. Now, now we can again test what, hap what happens if we're increasing the pump power. That's a very simple experiment. We use a green laser diode here in CW operational mode. You can see that from low to high pump power, the luminescence increases. And there is a very, there is a very soft change in the slope here, which you really, I mean, you have to look uh, twice to, to acknowledge that it's not a linear slope here, but there, there, is, there is some bending here which we can model by using standard scattering Boltzmann equation here. We also see that the mode changes its energy as we're pumping higher. So the, there's a blue shift here, which, which we can, um, uh, we can discuss later maybe, because it's actually, it's not, not, not completely straightforward where the blue shift comes from, but we have good reason to understand that it's actually coming from free electron interaction in the system. Um, what is, what is uh, interesting is that if we're now um, making the interference experiment once again at room temperature in this sample, we again see the emergence of a fringing pattern at, ev at, at ev elevated pump powers here, right? So you see, uh, this is again, now actually uh, there is a spectral filter built in with a monochromator. So we were only um, basically um, um, swapping one spatial dimension and not the two like we did before. But still, we can we can assess the um, the G1 function here by the Fourier analysis, and we actually see that spatial coherence in this mode starts to slowly build up with the injection of more more polaritons in the state. Also, it drops with a uh, with with the delay, with a temporal width on the order of four to five picoseconds. So this is I think it's the first first good hint that coherence can be can build up at room temperature in uh, TMDs in the strong coupling regime. Um, the threshold is a little bit too soft to make a, a, a super solid claim of polariton lasing, or um, uh, but but I think the, the the coherence is actually kind of um, 
it's a kind of a pleasant surprise that the experiment worked out uh, in, in that way. Okay, I'll I'll spend if 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 I'm allowed to, I'll spend another five minutes on on this last uh, part of the of the lecture because what I've what I've shown five minutes is good. Okay. Um, what I've shown that you thus far is experiments which were all conducted basically on, on, on a single section of the monolayer or in the last part, even on a naturally forming trap of the monolayer, which was induced probably by fragmentation of the monolayer. So it's a single, it's a single trap which develops some intrinsic coherence. Um, the way we think and many other think that the field can develop, for instance, from a fundamental research direction to more a technology in the, in the spirit of this uh, second quantum uh, revolution could be that we start to couple distinct traps with each other and uh, play around with interactions, self interactions, next neighbor interactions, for instance, to model Hamiltonians like the Bose Hubbard Hamiltonian, which is really hard to, uh, to calculate uh, in dimensions larger than unity if you want to go beyond the mean field. But there is, there is other, there's other systems which, which are interesting to explore with these kind of coupled, um, well-controllable sites. There's a lot of topological phenomena which, which one can explore. I think there is a lot of phenomena and problems in the Mori uh, structures which can be maybe explored with these kind of emulation type approaches. Um, which maybe can resolve some of the puzzles of the superconductivity uh, or, or even of uh, bosonic uh, features in, in Mori systems, etc. So I think it's it's really it's a nice it's a nice research direction um, for for various reasons. Um, however, um, I guess with team this is it's kind of tricky. At least if you want to work with, mon with monolithic samples, it's it's really complicated. That's why we were now resorting to open cavities, where we are having a, a lower Bragg mirror here. Uh, with the monolayer. This is a tungsten disulfide monolayer in this case. And we have a planar upper mirror here, um, which we can tune by changing. So this one is attached to a P2 actuator. So we can tune the cavity length dynamically and, and basically level out the, 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 the coupling conditions. So it works really nicely and re reversibly. And um, we, are, we are also using a focused iron beam um, in order to, um, to um, machine an intendation into the top mirror, which will now serve as a photonic trap um, to, to basically to tailor the optical mode in this, in this coupling here. So this is basically the, the engineering task to structure the DVR. If we're now looking at the dispersion relation of such a hemispheric trap with a high quality DVR underneath coupled to this tungsten disulfide monolayer, you can actually see that the mode as expected, no longer is parabolic as a dispersion relation, but it breaks up into this distinct, discrete um, optical modes here, which are induced by, by the shape of the trap. Um, because it's a parabola, um, the energy distance between the modes is almost the same. So it's more like, it's, it's almost like a harmonic confinement for polaritons, which we, which we can engineer here. And um, what is also very nice, um, is if, if, you, if, you, if you scan tomographically um, the modes, you see that the ground mode has a very nice Gaussian shape. The first excited mode looks like this donut. We have good reason to believe that it also carries the typical uh, angular orbital momentum here, which is another quantity one, one can explore in these, in these structures. And it really, it, really uh, it looks like textbook calculation you would expect from a from a harmonic trap for photons, but now they are actually, I mean, they're in the strong coupling with the, with the team, the excitons. So we have this, uh, this, this nice platform. And um, just as one, one experimental assessment here, we were, we were trying to check if we can now start to couple these one to another in an arrangement of a linear structure here. So we uh, one would expect that there should be some hopping to the next neighbor, which then in full analogy the textbook example of a one-dimensional chain for electrons should develop a band structure for the polaritons themselves by, uh, by development of a nice block mode, which, is, which goes over the system. And that is actually working. So we, we're seeing here that the, 
dispersion relation, which we first were breaking up into discrete modes on a single side, now by coupling to the next neighbor, forms, as you know, from the tight binding regime, a band structure, which has these gaps here at the edge of the Brillouin zone, the Brillouin zone, not of the atoms, but of the photonic um, structures here. By changing the distance between the structures, we can open the gap further and further. And at some point, finally, the structures are so far away that only for the higher orbital modes, you actually still see a dispersive feature, the ground mode is almost perfectly flat here. So you can really tune the mass. And because we have the top mirror attached to piezo actuators, we can actually tune the energy of this entire band structure by tweaking the cavity up and down. That's, I think it's, it's, a, really, it's a really nice feature. You can, can easily tune this over tens of, tens of uh, milli electron volts. Um, you're only limited in the end of the day by the Rabi splitting itself, because if you're too far detuned, there's simply no more light illuminating the cavity. But uh, in principle, uh, it's, it's a very nice tunable um, platform for further experiments. Um, and um, that's basically um, the, our current status um, of experimental research in this field of uh, TMD exciton polaritons. Um, it's a very short wrap up. So we have, I think, picked up kind of nicely compelling features at low temperature for the formation of a polariton condensate manifesting in this spatial coherence. Uh, at room temperature, the threshold is much more soft, but still um, there are good features of coherence in monochromatic states at large pump powers. And we, we could now start to engineer some first lattice experiments so we can basically explore a little bit more the inter, interplay between interaction and condensation in this, in this uh, engineered landscapes. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Uh, that's really impressive. Those uh, <laughs> those uh, room temperature polaritons. The <laughs> That's really, really amazing. So, um, well, so uh, many thanks for the for the presentation and the, and the lecture. And now we have the the lecture open for for questions. So, as I said, uh, whoever wants to make a question, just post it in the Q and A uh, Q and A that uh, that we have here in Zoom. So, I will uh, read a question by. Um, uh, El Madi Amar, who say, okay, thank you so much for the nice lecture. If I will understand what it was mentioned in slide 21, I would like to know if the step of using a screwdriver to create the micro cavity does an influence in the properties of your samples. He says, uh, however, the screwdriver material could generate some impurities on the first layers of the substrate. I guess um, everybody's intrigued about your screwdriver, <laughs> how good your screwdriver is. <laughs> I think we, we haven't systematically tested the material of the screwdriver, to be honest. Um, the, the, I think the, um, the, the real uh, mechanism is, so with a screwdriver, you only make a scratch from, from the top. Uh -huh. what, 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 is, what, is, what is the key is that your, your, your um, layer structure of the DVR has a finite adhesion to the substrate it was previously deposited on. And then only making a scratch and some mechanical strain usually will be good enough to let the entire layer structure pop up. So the interface, yeah. which you later on use to, to place on your, on your um, a uh, base structure never experiences the screwdriver. Um, okay. There is actually a lot of room for engineering though. I, so we have not really um, done this in the last detail, but at the moment, the, the, the group of uh, Elena Ostrovska, um, so the PhD screw, a student of her is a former master's student of mine, and he was involved in this first screwdriver attempt in Würzburg. I think he did a good deal of further development there, how to optimize the adhesion of the layer structure to the substrate to, to get more control over, over everything. And they, they have now reached, I think, an impressive amount of control up to a degree that they simply can peel off the entire rag layer. Oh, really? And, <laughs> and, and simply make it basically large scale and, and put it on, 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 a, on another carrier substrate. 
Yeah, because being mechanical seems to be uh, quite suitable for improvement, not for yeah, yeah. There and then the... No, no, but this is kind of kind of straightforward. So I think you you can play with the surface um, mm. uh, oxidation before before the, the evaporation, but also the uh, I mean no, nobody tells you you need to have a glass carrier, mm -hmm. and and you know that if you, if you use some. Uh, I think we, we in, in the past we've encountered that if we're depositing this titanium oxide, silicon oxide mirrors on perovskites, for instance, mm. and you can almost peel it off completely without any damage. Okay. So that, yeah, that's very, very interesting. So okay, so we have more questions here. So okay, I'm gonna read first the students' questions. Uh, so. Uh, Tiago Queiroz says, uh, hi, great talk. I'm not familiar with experiments featuring uh, both Einstein condensates. Uh, what physical properties do you probe to check its, informa its formation? Not its information, its formation. Yeah. Photoluminescence. Uh, you also mentioned reflectivity measurements in your first slides. Correct. Um, so the reflectivity measurement, we usually only do to check the system, to, to check the eigenstates of the system. That's usually the way to do it. I mean, you do reflectivity, the, 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 the density of particles uh, which you impose is very small and you simply probe if, if, if there are the polariton modes. I mean, you can also do it by weak pumping photoluminescence, but reflectivity is usually a pretty good tool to do that. In order to check if you see some um, um, polariton condensation, um, you typically run experiments at larger pump power so you, you pump it with an external laser, or you can also use um, electrical injection if you have engineered your sample in, in the right way. And you, you drive sufficient amount of polaritons into the system such that they start to overlap within their de Broglie wavelength, similar to the very basic picture of EEC where you I think, well, in, in cold mm. atoms, usually don't, they don't increase the, the particle density because that usually yields molecular formation or crystallization of the material. So they have to be in a very dilute regime and then reduce the temperature. Since photons typically, they don't crystallize, you can do it in a little bit of an easier way and we just increase the particle density, mm. which at some point yields the formation of a quantum degenerate state. And that is usually characterized by, like in the in the polariton system, usually this is this is accompanied by a threshold, um, which has a, a few reasons. But uh, it, it's actually it's a stimulated process, which means that it gets more efficient if we increase the pumping density, and that's a threshold condition. And mm -hmm. um, we also have to check if it's coherent. So, so we have to we have to basically measure the coherence of the light which is emitted from 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 the state, and, and that's something we do with interferometry. Hmm. But that's I, the, I think the interferometric experiment is absolutely indispensable if you want to make any sort of claim of a polariton condensate or whatever. You you simply have to do it. I mean, <laughs> anything <laughs> else is just um, well, you know. <laughs> You do a sloppy job, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you you see many many studies, no, without the actual measurement of the coherence, uh, especially in strong coupling, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where but just through a spectrum, you sort of claim, no, that you have yeah, strong it's coupling. Missive. It's a bit of missive, I think. So if mm -hmm. if you really want to want to solidify your claim of uh, condensation, mm -hmm. um, then you you should do. Um, and, and, and rightfully, it is demanded by most of the reference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, every now and then, yes, I do. We, we also have published before without the coherence, but uh, <laughs> there are papers which are usually not so well cited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we have a question by Joaquin Rossier. Um, so he's asking, what role is the spin degree of freedom playing? Are the excitons in the polaritons ballet polarized? And is this polarization dictated by the pumping laser? So it's a very good question. Three of them are, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a very, it's a very good question. Um, and I don't have a generic answer. So the, in, 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 in our particular condensation experiment, we used a linear polarized laser. 
So we basically have an equal balance of K and K prime excitons contributing to the condensation process. But I also have to say there is no there is no particular reason why we do that. Well, there is one, but it's it's technology. But it, well, it's it's a technicality. For some reason, the threshold was lower when we were, when we were using a linear pump laser, and I there I have to admit I don't know why because I would have expected the opposite to happen. But I think it's it's a result of the complexity of the micro cavity itself, which is always a little bit birefringent. And then if the cavity is a little bit birefringent the injection efficiency of the pump laser might be better if it's linear polarized. But I think that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's about it for the condensation experiment. Um, I believe, so we, we, have, we have run studies together with, um, with uh, Maxim Richard in Grenoble, where we were checking how the polaritons actually interact with each other. If, we're only using polaritons from one valley or polaritons from both valleys at the same time. And there seems to be a difference in the interaction. So if we're only having polaritons from one valley, the, I think the, the repulsive interaction between the polaritons uh, was slightly stronger, if I'm not, if, if I remember correctly. Um, but that is actually, um, I think it's not completely clear. Um, as far as I understand from the from the current literature, okay. Um, but there is actually there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, physics to explore because if if you can manage to to pump a condensate which is purely valley polarized, it would be marvelous because those valley polaritons they 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 pick up um, they pick up the Berry curvature of of the excitons from the valley, and then they should have. Uh, more exotic trajectories, for instance, if you if you can launch them and, and let them evolve, there should be some intrinsic topological phenomena which which, which should reveal reveal themselves. But um, in the in the condensed phase, unfortunately, we have not managed yet to make a very clean, fully valley valley polarized condensate, which as as um, uh, Mr. Rossier already indicates, you would do by making your pump laser circularly polarized, you only mm. inject excitons from one valley, you let them condense, mm. and then one, one could, for instance, check how, how, they, how they diffuse, how they ballistically expand. But in what? that case, uh, I guess the cavity, as you say, the anisotropy of the cavity will be critical, no? Because you will be depolarizing yeah. the, the laser, yeah. no? I see. So, yeah, so the, 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 that is true. On, on, on the pump side, it could be critical. But also on the um, what is happening after uh, after your polaritons are in a distinct state, if there is still a little bit of a birefringence from the cavity, then this will actually yield a beating between the valleys. Uh, it is actually something. Uh, let me see if I oh, like in this in this reference here. Um, this is an, an experiment which is not in the condensed regime, but where we were using this. Um, two photon injection of a state, which you could initialize with a very high fidelity, with a, with a high degree of polarization. There we actually did see that um, depending on the valley we pick, the, the polarization expands um, differently depending on the, on, on the, mm -hmm. on the momentum. And uh, so all these, these kind of things, I think they should be much stronger in the condensate, but we, we just I mean, haven't managed to run the experiment. Okay. Yeah, too many experiments yet to. <laughs> it's good. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> there was nothing to explore. We would be honest. Yeah, indeed. Talk, though, so, <laughs> that's the, so uh, I also have a couple of, of questions. Well, if anyone else wants to post their uh, more questions, just feel free. Um, because, yeah, I guess we still have five more minutes if, uh, <laughs> if you still have time, Christian. So, no, I, no, I, I, I have, I have, uh, now I have <laughs> plenty of time. <laughs> so, I, it has been very stressful up to now, but uh, right, right now it's you no. Know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was curious about again your screwdriver <laughs> technique. Uh, but um, I see your the DVR you put on top, no, it has a finite size, no. So yeah. effectively, you are creating a cavity which has a finite size, no. Yeah. Uh, and that will induce some lateral confinement in the in the modes of of the cavity, 
or, um, or the TMDC is small enough so yeah. that doesn't take a, play any role. That's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think I think in 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 all of our experiments at the moment it's the latter. Uh -huh. the team, the team, like the, the the TMDC flakes, which we were which we were investigating in these two particularly chosen experiments, they were kind of small. So the moly selenide was, I think, five by uh, twenty micrometers in size. Um, the 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 Miro itself was, I think, fifty or sixty micrometers large. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you if you if you have the the, the TMD itself, it actually it's only one atom thick or three atom thick however you count, but um, the path difference of the light mm. is actually, I think it's a few nanometers. So okay. you, you already shift, you already shift your, your photonic mode a little bit. And then by the strong coupling, you, you gain another few milli electron volts of Rabi splitting. So the, the potential trap you form just by the presence of the monolayer is actually kind of strong. And that, um, like that, we, we have not seen any effect of the finite size of the of the mm -hmm. um, destroyed um, Bragg mirror. But I mean, to but be that honest, that would be an extra uh, degree of freedom to explore, or or you you are not plan you, you don't think no, that. No, we're uh, actually. That, I think uh, I think we're. I mean, because it's something which is kind of kind of hard to control at the very end. So. Um, it, it, it's rather these kind of um, structures mm. which we're exploring right now because there we use a focused ion beam. We, we we can sort of carve any geometry that we wish into the substrate, and then like that we can tune the mode very very conveniently. I mean, nobody tells us it needs to be a hemispheric trap. We can make a white mm. guide or a, a donut. Or name it. I, I don't know. Do you have anything interesting? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, it was more a general, uh, a general question. Since yeah. in the, since in the, uh, especially single emitters with micro pillars, no, that you you have done in the past, no, a, a lot, and yeah. the, those lateral, uh, those, those lateral right. confinements can play a very critical role, no, in the. However, you know that the the, the most impressive experiment with the single quantum dots is also now exactly made on precisely such such cavity from uh, Richard Wolpert and group there. They're using a hemispheric mm -hmm. trap. Um, they're using a silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide top mirror. <laughs> the bottom mirror is a gallium arsenide with an indium arsenide top, but it, it, is, uh, it, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a good deal harder to, to implement those cavities at cryogenic temperatures. That's something we're gonna try um, probably by the end of the year. At the moment, mm -hmm. this is all room temperature for two reasons. First reason, I think up to a couple of weeks ago, we haven't had a cryo, cryo here, so <laughs> not, not, too, not yeah. too many options. <laughs> um, but it's also, um, at, 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 at room temperature is kind of easy to get proper cavities without vibrating too much. But at, at, um, at, at 5 Kelvin in the dry cryostat, it's going to be really good. Mm. But not, not impossible. And maybe maybe just a general question to uh, to finish. Uh, so apart from the from this from the two D materials, no, what other materials? Because this was like quantum walls, quantum dots, no, now two D and Cs. So what's the <laughs> what do you envision is the next uh, <laughs> the next material? There is still plenty, obviously plenty yeah, so to do in two D materials, but uh, in terms of polaritons. A bit molecular, I don't know. There is plenty. Yeah, of yeah, we have, a, uh, we have a we have a molecular so, polariton activity running. So, mm -hmm. so, so you but, see but, the molecular competing with the. We were also doing some, no, some work on that. So you see the molecular competing with the two D materials, <laughs> eventually, mm -hmm. or they are different. Animals. No, I think it's different. The, the scope is different. So, so I mean, what, what what we do is actually it's almost it's almost a little bit ignorant because we're we're, we're using the molecular crystal uh, the, the the molecules only really as a, a a tool to provide sufficient gain for the polaritons to let them condense. But then all, mm -hmm. all the physics we explore is up has nothing to do with molecular physics. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's really it's, it's just another material so, to, to to run uh -huh. condensation experiments. Um, and there they work marvel. Uh, so we'll be using uh, proteins for that. M, M cherry fluorescent proteins. Okay. Mm -hmm. They work very nice. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a that's the most exotic material I can 
I, I can name at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably yeah. I guess uh, the good thing about 2D materials is that 2D materials is that uh, in that sense they are uh, slightly more controllable. Well, yeah. Un until a certain point, no. But yeah. They 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 are very controllable and, and very versatile. I mean, mm. now you know, I guess most of the groups and we are also doing this um, starting to play with different combinations of 2D materials, and then um, I mean, you you can really. Uh, I think expect a lot of interesting effects in particular from uh, hetero heterostructures in micro cavities. I mean, there mm. was a recent nature paper from Hui Beng where it was already shown that the interaction of, of, of polaritons, if you use um, Van der Waals heterostructures can be enhanced by I don't know, a factor of 50 or so. Mm. Um, and uh, I think there's a, a lot of other phenomena which 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 can can become um, interesting. So we have two late questions here. So I will go through them quickly, uh, <laughs> and then we, we can probably close the, the session. So one is by um, uh, by Joao Enriquez, uh, who is asking: combining the TMD with a magnetic substrate will break the valley symmetry, similar to a huge external magnetic field. And it should be possible to excite a single valley with linearly polarized light. Will such an heterostructure be usable in dimension experiments? I think there might even be an experiment by the group of Sasha Tatakovsky that has done something like that. Mm -hmm. um, they, I know they have tried it. I think there was a. There, I think there is. There might be a paper from the Sheffield group. You have to check. It, 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 it should be possible. We we have tried to use uh, these um, um, more exo exotic substrates for us. The the, the magnet like this 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 uh, uh, magnetization effect was not not really not really so strong. But I, maybe we did something wrong in the experiment. That's actually kind of a few years ago we were trying that. But um, yeah, it should okay. be possible, and I think it might might even have been done. Okay, and then we have a question by Sara Nunez Sanchez. Uh, so she's asking really nice experiment studying the fundamentals of condensates at room temperature with 2D materials. It's great, it's great to see that it's possible to play with them at room temperature. In the case of application as a material platform for quantum technologies, taking into account that your experiments are based on 2D flakes, do you think that it could be possible in the future to apply them in large areas? Yeah. And I think that's really a good point for for uh, exciton polaritons because you you if you str strongly couple to light, um, the the so I mean in in the in the two D layer, if you compare exfoliated with grow material, usually in the grow material you see a broader exciton peaks and you have more impurities and more disorder. Once once you once you couple uh, to the optical field, uh, the photon almost like irons over the disorder because now your polariton no longer has a bore radius of two nanometer like the exciton which mm -hmm. is very sensitive to structural disorder on the atomic scale but your polariton has a, has a radius of hundreds of nanometers so even, even a micrometer so it really doesn't feel the disorder on the atomic scale anymore so you, I think yes this should so, but be, could um, that compensate the fact that usually the quality is, is lower, the larger the area of, of I, I mean, during the fabrication or? I, I think at least the structural disorder, mm -hmm. if the quality is lower in terms of internal quantum efficiency, then I do not know to which extent it can be mitigated okay. by this effect. But it's mm. like with the again with the organic molecules. I mean, they are disordered all over the place, and still they str nicely couple strongly mm. to a cavity and give a reasonably narrow bandwidth. And the same should actually work for for TMDs. Mm. And there, I uh, have I the, don't have the reference. So um, there is an archive paper um, from the group of uh, Ostrovskaya, which I can you, you have to look it up. It, it, it came on archive in end of March on ballistic uh, polariton uh, propagation at room temperature. 
um, and um, mm -hmm. they have basically seen that. So that you know, with the cavity, the, the, the bandwidth gets very narrow, and then you start to see ballistic phenomena, um, which should otherwise not be possible because of structural disorder. But that's still an exfoliated material. And they use mm -hmm. the screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you like it. <laughs> no, it's, it's my former master student who did the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. We have to try here at the NL the screwdriver approach as well. We have yeah. quite some activity here in 2D materials as well, quite some strong activity. So, <laughs> so when, when you visit us, you can then uh, <laughs> bring your screwdriver on. <laughs> as, as a gift. As a gift. As a gift. Okay. Uh, good. So I think with, uh, with this, probably we don't have uh, more questions here. So probably we can then uh, close the session. So thank you very much for for the nice presentation, Christian, for presenting all this very nice, uh, very nice result and enlightening us on the polaritonics of 2D materials. <laughs> and well, we hope to. Me. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice picture. Well, it's okay. actually in the neighborhood, so we, we do have beaches here as well. So oh, it's... really? Okay. <laughs> no, Oldenburg is uh, it's, it's less than 30 minutes from, from, my, from my house to the beach. Okay, and you have uh, <laughs> that's that's nice. <laughs> it's it's that, raining all the time. Doesn't look like the water is too is too hot, but <laughs> that's good in summer, right? So it's really it's, it's very uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so okay. thank you very much, and uh, 